In 1959, 10 students set off on a hiking expedition from the town of Vizhai in the Soviet Union. Nine of them were never seen alive again. Weeks after they went missing, a search and rescue team found the student's tent. It was cut from the inside out, as if whoever was inside was in a panicked rush to get out. Footprints left by bare feet led to the edge of a nearby forest, where rescuers found a makeshift fire and the first two bodies. From there, the rest of the students' remains were found over the next several months, many with gruesome, inexplicable injuries. What exactly happened is still a mystery, resulting in conspiracy theories ranging from the KGB, secret Soviet nuclear weapons tests, UFOs, Yetis, and murderous, bloodthirsty local tribes. The truth, as always, is likely more grounded than that, but that hasn't stopped speculative fiction from spinning their own theories. Take, for example, Colot, a first-person horror game released in 2015 that changes so many of the facts and adds so many supernatural elements as to be pure fiction. Polish developer and publisher IMG and Pro released Colot in June 2015 to mixed reviews. Perhaps the best-known thing about the game is that they snagged the famous Sean Bean as narrator. This is a walking simulator in the purest sense. There's no interaction from the player whatsoever. In fact, the player is so marginalized, it's impossible to tell who you are and hard to understand what you're even doing. But first, let me give you the backstory. On January 27th, 1959, 10 students from the Ural Polytechnical Institute set off from the small town of Vizhai in the Soviet Union to go on a hiking and skiing expedition. They were, apologies for butchered pronunciations in advance, 23-year-old Igor Dyatlov, who was leading the group, Yuri Doroshenko, who once charged at a bear wielding a hammer on a previous expedition, Zinaida Kolmogorova, who was called the Engine of the University, Rustam Slobodin, who often brought and played a mandolin on hiking trips, Ludmila Dubanina, the youngest of the group at only 20, and who in 1958 was accidentally shot in the leg by a hunter, Alexander Kolivatov, a student of nuclear physics, Nikolay Thibault Brignolo, the son of French communists, Yuri Krivonischenko, who was involved in the Kishchim disaster in 1957, Semyon Zolotaryov, the oldest of the group at 38 and an experienced tour guide, and Yuri Yefimovich Yudin, the luckiest sufferer of chronic joint pain in history. He quit the expedition early, turning back on June 28th due to knee and joint pains caused by rheumatism. He would be the last to see the nine others alive. Despite their youth and various ailments, they were all experienced hikers, each holding Grade 2 hiker status, which would be upgraded to Grade 3 upon their return. Their goal, or at least one of them, was to receive that Grade 3 hiker certification, which they were going to achieve by climbing the Otorten Mountain, part of the Ural Mountain Range. As a Level 3 grade hike, their journey would be the most difficult possible. Before leaving, Igor Dyatlov agreed to send UPI Sports Club a telegram when the group returned to Vizhai in two weeks. The hike was expected to last no later than February 12th, but expeditions like this, in such cold and far-reaching places as Siberia, often take longer than expected. In fact, as Yudin was turning back, Dyatlov told him he thought it would take several days more, which Yudin passed on to the sports club. When the 12th came and went without a telegram, nobody thought anything of it. On January 31st, the hikers prepared a cache of food and gear, stashing it on a wooden platform in a forest called Labaz. Shortly after that, they made camp for the night. The next morning, they traveled through what we now call the Dietlov Pass, later named after the group's leader. They intended to head north through the forest, making camp on the banks of the Lavza River, then continue north to Otorten Mountain. But a sudden snowstorm overtook the pass, diminishing visibility and dropping the temperature significantly. It wasn't until February 20th, after being pressured by the missing hikers' families, that the Institute notified police and sent out search and rescue parties. At first, it was mostly the Institute's faculty and staff, but it wasn't long before the police and Soviet military joined the search, deploying hundreds of searchers, planes, and helicopters. So, do you play as a member of the search and rescue party in Kolot? Yes. No. Maybe? Kolot starts by giving you the facts, Sean Bean somberly telling us about the hikers and how they went missing. You start at a train station, and you're just told to go forward. Whoever you play as in Colot, you're out there by yourself, so obviously no search and rescue member would be out there operating solo like this. Colot isn't based on the student's experience or the subsequent search and rescue. Instead, so much of this game is being utterly confused and lost. Now, this is one of Colot's better aspects. IMG and Pro does a magnificent job with environmental storytelling. You're left to figure out what to do on your own, and that involves looking for landmarks like a radio tower or a ramshackle hut off by itself somewhere, all the while it's relentlessly snowing and dark. There's no obvious set path either, and while the world is linear, it's still easy to get lost with such low visibility and not knowing what you're supposed to do. When you arrive at these locations, you'll find diary entries from the hikers. They're run out to you by the students 
students themselves, and while the acting is good, the writing is... yeah. They drone on and on about supernatural nonsense, science experiments gone wrong, and any other cliché you can think of. It's odd given the hikers actually kept a diary, one rescuers found, and that can easily be read online. It's no secret. You'd think these would be in the game, but they're not. In fact, there are all kinds of hoaxes and theories concerning this diary, which is even more weird that it's not in the game. In Mountain of the Dead, Keith McCloskey writes that one member of the group wrote on a piece of paper a day or two before their deaths, now we know snowmen exist. In the Discovery Channel documentary Russian Yeti The Killer Lives, featuring Batman actor Kevin Conroy as narrator no less, experienced climber Michael Lebecki reads what he says is a quote from a newspaper the students brought with them that reads, From now on we know that snowmen exist. As DietlovPass.com writes, the only mention of any snowman in the diary is a newspaper the students had been making called The Evening of Torton No. 1, which was a satire of Soviet propaganda. That's why it's so hard finding accurate information about what actually happened, because even seemingly credible sources like Discovery and Batman can be wrong. Maybe Colot was trying to play on these hoaxes with these ridiculous diary entries, but they could have been more subtle about it, as opposed to having one hiker talk about how much of a monster he is in the very first diary you find. There's not much to say about Colot on a historical level, so much was changed or added that to say it's about the Diet Law of Pass incident just wouldn't really be right. Instead, let's focus on what the search and rescue teams found that left so much open for conspiracy theories and horror games. On February 23rd, three days after the search began, a helicopter dropped off Boris Slobstov and a small team at the base of Otorton Mountain, the hikers' intended destination. The following day, they made it to the peak of the mountain and found no trace the hikers had made it that far. On February 25th, the group discovered ski tracks that they believed were left by the hikers. After a day of following the tracks, they ended up at Kolot Siakl, approximately 6 miles south of Otorton and 40 miles north of Vies High, the town where the student hikers were last seen and were supposed to make contact on the way back home. The search party found a tent used by the hikers, a special elongated tent that Slobstov himself helped Igor Dyatlov create. Here's where things take a turn for the... bizarre. Slobstov discovered that the tent was cut open, and a later investigation revealed that it was cut open from the inside, likely with Rustam Slobdom's knife as it was laying outside of the tent. Slobstop and his group then stumbled upon footprints leading away from the tent. The prints were barefooted, or as it was later discovered, people wearing only socks and one boot among them. The search party followed the footprints for a mile before losing them at the edge of a forest. It didn't make much of a difference. There, next to the remains of a fire, they found the first two bodies, those of Krivoshenko and Dorshenko. They were both shoeless and wearing nothing but their underwear. Further in the woods, they found three more bodies, Kol Magorova, Slobodin, and Dyatlov himself. They too were poorly dressed and all died away from each other at distances of 980 feet, 1500 feet, and 2000 feet away from the first two bodies. Police immediately launched an investigation. Investigators found no apparent injuries to the first group of hikers, other than a Slobodin who had a small crack in his skull. How he got this injury is still unknown, but it wasn't deemed fatal. Instead, investigators concluded they all died of hypothermia. On May 4th, three months after they went missing, the remains of the last four hikers were found. Their bodies were at the bottom of a ravine, 250 feet, 76 meters, into the woods away from the others. They were in the middle of a forest, buried under 13 feet of snow. Those four, Dubanina, Kolivatov, Thibaut Brignolo, and Zolotaryov, were better dressed than the first four survivors they found. All four of them had major, fatal injuries. Thibaut Brignolo had severe damage to his skull, Zolotaryov had major rib fractures and was missing both eyeballs, yes, you heard that right, Dubanina also suffered rib fractures, her tongue was missing, and her eyes and part of her lips. Kolivatov had severe hypothermia and had broken, exposed skull shards. But strangest of all, and what sparked decades of conspiracy theories, is this. Dubanina and Kolivatov both had trace amounts of radiation on them. These last four had dug a shelter, a small trench in the snow with branches covering the bottom to keep themselves off the frozen ground, yet none of their bodies were found within the shelter. There are some answers here, but not enough to conclude what happened. Dubanina's body was found in a stream at the bottom of the ravine, leading the medical examiner, one Dr. Boris Vazrozdeheni, to conclude her missing facial features to have resulted from the running water. A little speculation leads one to believe that maybe their shelter wasn't good enough and they left to find something better. Maybe they ran out of food or water and they left to find more and either way they fell into the ravine and died. But there are still vital questions without simple explanations. Why did the group separate in the first place? What caused these gruesome injuries? And where did the radiation come from? 
With no real clues about what exactly killed these last four hikers, the investigation was closed in May 1959 and all related files sealed away until the 90s. There are plenty of conspiracy theories though. It's the Yeti, the KGB, UFOs, talk of Soviet nuclear testing and other secret weapons. Then there's more original stuff like teleportation, gravity fluctuations, ball lightning, and infrasound. I found an interesting note in a Forbes article from 2019 stating, Recent research suggests that a rare weather phenomenon, whirlwinds formed by the air flowing over the summit of Halahachal, created infrastructure vibrations. This sound below the range of human hearing affects directly the human nervous system, causing irrational fear in the members of the hiking group. As they fled the campsite, they realized too late that they were lost in a snowstorm. The article doesn't cite what this recent research is, though. Also, recent research suggests is really hard to say. One of my favorite theories is that the hikers were all high on shrooms. No, really, it's one of the theories, and it's and others are linked to the Monsi people. The Monsi are the indigenous people living at the Kanti Monsi, an autonomous district deep within Russia and where the Dyatlov Pass is located. The Monsi speak their own language and have their own culture. The Monsi, like any indigenous native group of people living within a newer nation's borders, are all well respected and treated by the government, and the Russian people at large, too. Oh, uh, wait, no, sorry, silly me. Uh, I meant to say they've been oppressed and looked down upon for hundreds of years. Sorry. Since the beginning of the Russian Empire, the Monsi were treated as second-class citizens. They were forced to pay high taxes on furs, a vital supply in the harsh conditions of Siberia. In the 1960s, oil was discovered in Monsi land, and the Soviet Union allowed the Monsi to drill the oil themselves and bought and sold it at reasonable rates. Everyone was happy, and they all- oh wait, no, sorry, there I go again. They were actually forcibly moved off their lands to villages throughout Russia, kicking off the greatest internal migration in the Soviet Union since World War II, allowing Russian oil companies to move in. By 1990, the Soviet Union had exported over $20 billion of oil and gas from the region, and the Monsi didn't see a penny of it. As part of their religious rituals, the Monsi harvest fly agaric mushrooms native to the region. The mushroom has become iconic thanks to Mario, of all things, but what Mario doesn't tell you is that they're highly toxic in their raw form. The Monsi discovered that by drying them in the sun, it renders out much of the toxins, but they're still super hallucinogenic. The mushroom theory suggests that, for whatever reason, the hikers ate some of these mushrooms, making them delirious enough to cut their tent open and run outside without any of their gear, get lost in the storm, and eventually die from a combination of the poison and cold weather. The other theory is that a group of Monsi hunters killed the hikers for entering their sacred hunting grounds. Again, this goes back to the belief that the Monsi are inferior to the Russian people, and that the tribe is weird, and they have all these weird, silly customs, and blah blah blah. But one man put weight to that theory. In Svetlana Oss's book Don't Go There, which investigates the Dyatlov Pass incident, she quotes multiple people saying that the Monsi are willing to murder anyone who enters their sacred hunting grounds. One source she quotes is Ivan Uvarov, who testified in a criminal case the following. About the Monsi, I know that their sacred mountain is about 40 kilometers south of the place of the hikers' deaths. 45 years ago, there was one accident with a hunter from the Pershino settlement. He climbed that mountain and took part of the food they had left their gods. He brought some of it back to his home. He did this again, but then disappeared and was never seen again. There were some rumors he took an arrow designed for hunting animals. Oss, an accomplished investigative journalist with published work in the New York Times and Moscow Times, then goes on to lay out her own theory, starting with, It is quite obvious that the very first suspects, the Monsi, at least knew who killed the Dyatlov team and, most likely, silently approved. She then goes on for about 20 pages about how a group of 10 Monsi people, armed with guns, forced the hikers out of their tent with smoke, then forced them to take their shoes off for some reason. She says some of the group tried to fight their attackers, resulting in the Monsi using their guns as clubs, causing the other hikers to run off. The Monsi then searched the group's tent and left the survivors alone. Why didn't the Monsi just shoot them? Because then it would be obvious they were murdered, duh. Later on, she speculates that other Monsi hunters found the bodies and cut out Dubinina's tongue and the eyes and all that other stuff because reasons. I don't want to get too bogged down in conspiracy theories, I just wanted to give you a little taste of some of them. You need to get yourself into this weird mindset if you're going to give Colada a try for yourself, because the game isn't much better. Yeah, we were talking about a video game three hours ago, remember that? Colot embraces these conspiracy theories. The game ends with the startling revelation that not only were the hikers murdered, but that you were the one who killed them. 
In the game's true ending, unlocked by finding all the diary entries, you approach a tent and the screen turns black. We hear something ripping, perhaps the tent being cut, and a woman screams and the credit rolls, all while Sean Bean rambles on about true madness and how nobody is innocent. That doesn't jive with what a recent investigation into the incident found. What a surprise. On February 4th, 2019, Russian prosecutors announced they had launched a new investigation into the Nine Hikers' deaths. This new investigation was only looking into three theories they deemed the most likely scenarios, ruling out any crime as well as alien abductions, Soviet weapons testing, and all that other fun stuff. Over a year later, on July 11th, 2020, Russian prosecutor Andrei Kuryakov announced he and his team had come to a conclusion. The hikers died of an avalanche. Prosecutors say an avalanche hit their tent, burying it deep under the snow. They quickly somehow dug themselves out of the snow and tried to hike back. Having left the tent, Kuryakov said, the group altogether without panic moved 50 meters away. They went to a stone ridge, which served as a natural avalanche breaker. They did everything right. And here's the second reason why the group was, let's say, sentenced to death, why they never came back. When they turned around, they could not see the tent. From there, Kuryakov says the group made their big mistake. They broke up. Two groups were formed. One stayed by the stone ridge and built a fire with the branches. The other group, led by Dietlov, tried to go back to the tent by following their tracks to get their supplies. By this point, the temperature had dropped to minus 40 degrees Celsius, which is also minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. They didn't make it long thanks to the extreme colds and lacking supplies. When the first group didn't come back, the second group set out to find them, but somehow caused a mini avalanche which swept them back into the ravine, burying them under the snow. This is also what caused the skull and rib fractures. Later, some of the bodies were set upon by animals who ate the eyes, lips, and tongues of the hikers. As for the radioactive material, some of the students worked with radioactive substances at the university, so it's theorized this was left over from whatever they were doing before they left for the hike. The victims' families, however, aren't satisfied with that answer. Yevgeny Chernosov, probably mispronounced that, who represents the families of the victims, said that not only do the families not accept this answer, but that the investigation was unlawful in the first place since the case was closed and can only be reopened if it was a criminal investigation. He also put forth his own theory, saying, the hikers might have died after an explosion in near space, an accidental crash of a rocket, or the fall of the booster stage of a rocket. The group were covered by a poisonous cloud, a mixture of gases of rocket fuel, components, and combustion products. They were poisoned. It was impossible to breathe, so they panicked, half-blind, and fled down away from the focus of the incident. Yuri Yudin, the 10th hiker who turned back in the last minute, also doesn't buy it. Before his death in 2013, he theorized that his friends saw something they shouldn't have seen and that they were forced at gunpoint to create a confusing scene of destruction before they were separated and killed. I'm going to refrain from positing my own theories as I just don't have enough solid evidence. Also, I'm not an investigator. I make crappy videos for the internet that no one watches. We may never know exactly what happened to this group of nine student hikers, but I feel pretty confident ruling out UFOs, nuclear weapon tests, shrooms, or even the Monsi. Colot received mixed reviews when it came out, and it's not hard to see why. The atmosphere is good, but it's wasted on an absurd plot that doesn't respect history or even the player. I don't dislike the game because it's historically inaccurate. They clearly weren't going for a realistic approach here. I just always find it tacky when games and movies take real-life tragedies like this and then twist them so completely as to not give the audience any idea about the actual facts. There are plenty of people out there who want to believe in a grand conspiracy conspiracy around these hikers' deaths, and Colot plays right into it. I'm not saying the game is going to spark a shortage of tinfoil, just that it doesn't do anyone any favors. Imagine if we instead played a member of the search and rescue team, and we somehow got separated and went missing ourselves, and we had to try and survive, only to stumble on the hikers' bodies. We could find their real-life diary, and that could bring in the ghosts, and you'd have to run from then while still having to survive the harsh conditions. That sounds a lot better to me. People don't really want to to know the truth, they want the mystery.